wacky design and unusual technical solutions were what used to set Citroen apart from other brands. However, in recent years, in my view, Citroen became a kind of a Peugeot sub-brand. So you were essentially getting the same car, the same car as a Peugeot, but with a different body and a different interior. And I remember that a few years ago, Peugeot announced that it was making itself the primary brand of the Peugeot Citroen group and that Citroën would be more of a budget-friendly option. In other words, they made Peugeots the fancy cars and Citroëns the more affordable and slightly funky ones. And I honestly think that that approach diluted the Citroën brand, which is one of the best automotive brands with the best heritage and the best history. And over the past decade or so, or more actually, I always felt like Citroën had kind of lost its way. However, thankfully, it looks like the manufacturer represented by the dual Chevron logo is undergoing a resurgence. And it is returning to its roots as a manufacturer of comfy and slightly quirky cars. And while this is reflected in some other vehicles like the new C4, for instance, I think it's nowhere near as well reflected as it is in the new C5X. This vehicle is basically the third generation C5. However, the previous two generations were sedans or wagons. And the car that I'm driving today, the C5X, is neither. It is a cross between a hatchback or a fastback, an estate, a coupe, and of course a crossover because it is 2023 and people just have to have that raised ride height and the SUV-esque look. And while I think that many vehicles that try to pull off this approach fail, I mean, I don't find many of them appealing, it is the exact opposite with the C5X. It looks so unconventional and it's such a weird presence on the road, but I mean that in the best possible way. I'd almost say that in spite of its um, weird design or unusual design, let's say, it is not a bad vehicle to look at. And the more you look at it and the more design details you see, the more you start to like it. It also has a very well-built interior featuring quite good materials. It almost feels premium. There's oodles of space. It's very efficient, regardless if you go for the plug-in hybrid version or not. And it's actually a really, really great buy and a vehicle that doesn't really have any natural rivals. I guess it would rival uh, wagons or estate vehicles, but at the same time, those don't feature this uh, raised ride height and they don't look as uh, rakish as the C5X. So let's break it down. The C5X is built on the same EMP2 EVO platform as the latest 308 and Opel Astra or Vauxhall Astra if you're from the UK. This means it inherits those vehicles engine options bar the diesels. So the base vehicle has a 1.2 liter three cylinder turbocharged engine that makes 130 horsepower. And even though you might think that that's not enough for this vehicle, because it's quite a big vehicle, it's over 4.8 meters in length, it's actually fine for most people who um, just wanna cruise around because the vehicle isn't especially heavy. Then there's this version that I'm driving today, the 1.6 liter four cylinder turbocharged engine with 180 horsepower and 300 newton meters of torque. This is enough to push the C5X to 100 kilometers per hour in under eight seconds. And in all honesty, when setting off, it actually feels quicker than that. The top of the range powertrain option is the plug-in hybrid. It relies on the same 1.6 liter turbocharged four as this version that I'm driving today, but it adds an electric motor for a combined total of 225 horsepower and it drops its sprint time to 100 kilometers per hour by around one second. It's also over 100 kilos heavier, and it has a few features that this version doesn't have. Even though all C5Xs have the special hydraulic bump stop, which basically means that this car's suspension has its own suspension, so it's extra comfy without relying on adaptive dampers, you can actually get adaptive dampers in the plug-in hybrid, and the vehicle also gets a camera that reads the road in front of the vehicle, and it can see imperfections and potholes, and it increases comfort by slackening the suspension off whenever it sees that you're about to go over some unevenness. I bet that makes the vehicle even more comfortable and it probably reduces body roll and uh, pitch and dive. I actually don't think that it's necessary, especially since you're not gonna drive this vehicle sportily. You're not gonna throw it into corners. It is not about that. So even though the plug-in hybrid, which is also a bit heavier, is probably even more comfortable, you honestly don't need the extra complication and adaptive dampers that car gets a dedicated comfort mode, which isn't available in this vehicle, which doesn't have the adaptive dampers. And coming back to the powertrain for a second, I honestly really feel like this 
A 180 horsepower engine is perfectly adequate for this vehicle. And as I said, I feel it is a bit quicker than the figure suggests. So let's put it in sport. Let's build the boost. It's so floaty, so good. It does, of course, lean into the bends a little bit, but it's honestly reasonably well controlled. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but the steering is surprisingly accurate, even off center. It gives the vehicle a vague, vague sporty feel, but this is the only sporty part of the driving experience because everything else is um, clearly geared towards comfort. And that's perfectly, perfectly fine. In terms of its ground clearance, this vehicle is marginally higher than a normal vehicle, but lower than an SUV. And some have said that it doesn't have any natural rivals, which it doesn't, because there isn't another vehicle of this type. And I certainly agree with that. This is the kind of car you buy if you uh, want an estate car, a wagon, but you also feel that you need the extra ground clearance and the practicality of an SUV. Because for instance, this does have some SUV features. The doors cover the sills, so you don't get your pants dirty, and it has reasonably good approach and departure angles. Not that you're going to take this vehicle off-road, willingly because it's not available with all-wheel drive and i actually think that it's all the better for it to be honest space in the trunk is also reasonably good it's 545 liters or if you opt for the plug-in hybrid version that drops by um, 80 liters i think but that's still pretty good space for passengers in the back is remarkable taller adults who are over six foot or 180 ish centimeters tall might start to struggle for headroom however the seats are so comfy that you can slouch down and really, really find a nice position for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. The levels of legroom in the back are very, very good. You can stretch out with no problem. I mean, I have no issues fitting behind myself in my ideal driving position, which is quite far back and all the way down. This car also gets Citroen's advanced comfort seats as standard. They're an option on the smaller C4, but they come as standard here. And essentially it's, um, the seat equivalent of what Citroen has done to the suspension because there's the usual padding that seats have and then there's also a layer of memory foam, soft memory foam on top of it, which cushions the cushions and it really works. These are some of the best seats that you can find in a non-premium car these days. They're really, really good and they really help this vehicle um, achieve its goal of being ridiculously comfortable, which it is. The vehicle is also remarkably quiet, even at speed. I'm doing almost 100 kilometers per hour now, and it's really, really quiet. You can not optionally add double glazing to all four side windows, and it is really quiet for a vehicle of this type. Interestingly, this vehicle is built in China and is perhaps also aimed at the Chinese buyer who values a lot of rear legroom. And there's even these buttons here that you can control the passenger seat with so you can push it forward or back and move the backrest. You can change the angle of the backrest just to make sure the, the passenger that sits uh, diagonally from the driver in the back is as comfortable as possible. Now, this is a luxury car feature and it shows Citroen's intention with this vehicle to woo buyers away from traditional premium vehicles and try its more affordable take on a very comfy cruiser. From the driver's perspective, you are greeted by a very nicely designed interior with a tiered layout, nice materials, especially on top of the dash. This is soft, this is soft. There's a very interesting fake textured wood that actually has the same uh, texture as the, um, this plastic here, this gray plastic in the middle section of the dash. I'll put some B-roll in to show you what I mean. You get a squared off steering wheel that is heated in my tester at least, and it was ridiculously hot. It is the hottest steering wheel I think I've ever held in a car. When you enable the heating, well, you are advised to take your hands off the wheel. I'm kidding, of course, don't do that. But it's really, really hot. I found myself turning it on, turning it off many times. I would have maybe liked several strength settings, you know, those would have gone a long way. My tester also has the larger of the two available infotainment screens. This one's a 12 inch unit, which is quite good. I have to, to say it's better than older Peugeot Citroen infotainments. The screen itself, being a 12 inch screen, is pretty big. The standard one is a 10 inch. And the infotainment it runs is also pretty good. It's not the best, 
but I do appreciate the fact that it's highly customizable and you can have a home screen with pretty much anything you want on it. Although I would like some more shortcuts to, the, um, to some of the functions. For instance, this car has optional seat massagers, which are really good, especially for a non-premium vehicle. And in fact, I'm going to enable them now. So let's see, uh, applications, seats, and away we go. As you can see, I've been using Apple CarPlay, which works very, very well, and it connects very, very quickly after you've uh, climbed aboard the vehicle with your phone on you. Kudos to Citroen for also providing you with physical climate controls. They are the typical traditional one you would find in any Citroen because it's Citroen. They don't have access to any fancier uh, controls. I mean, Citroen is known for doing this. In the case of the C6, for instance, its former flagship and one of my favorite modern Citroens. The interior was so, so fancy and it looked amazing. It had great materials all around and very, very premium looking design and a very luxurious feel. You got the climate buttons from the C4 and they looked so, so out of place. They almost ruined the interior. I'm pretty sure every reviewer who had a chance to drive one of those back in the day, they said that, oh, the interior is amazing, but what's up with this C4 nonsense here? And while it's not as jarring with the rest of the experience in this vehicle, in fact, the controls feel nice and damped and they are of reasonably high quality, I really am a fan of traveling aboard this vehicle. It's super nice. All doors have big door pockets. The uh, armrest cubby is big. You get two big cup holders here in the center. And by the way, this element has a nice floating design to it. The one that houses the, the cup holders, the selector for the transmission, the driving modes, and the electric parking brake. It sits slightly higher than the console itself, and it's a very stylish way of integrating it, and it's subtle. Citroen again is showing off its design prowess in the little things that you may not notice. And I appreciate the subtlety. This is the first Citroen ever which gets an actual 360 degree view system with cameras all around the vehicle. My tester doesn't have it. It still relies on the same old system that uses the backup camera to create a top-down picture of what's around you. But even this is better than in older Citroen. So even if you don't go for the optional 360 degree system, you still get a better picture of what's around you than in older Citroens. And this is also helped by the fact that the new 12 inch screen is of higher definition than anything I've ever seen in a Citroen before. The display in front of the driver is not my favorite though. It is really, really small, really, really lacking in information. And I don't know, I would have liked to be able to see more on it because sure you can configure it. So you can have nothing, you can have the map displayed on the screen, I guess that's pretty good, but you have it here, so why would you have it displayed in the small screen? You can also have a rev counter. Citroën would tell you that the reason they did this was because you also get information displayed on the head-up display, which is fair. For instance, the, um, the speed limit, you cannot see it in this small display, but you can see it in the HUD. When it comes to the driving position, you don't sit as high as you might think in this vehicle. You can get the seat reasonably low for a vehicle of this type. I mean, I feel like I am sitting in this vehicle rather than on it. And I like that you can adjust the angle of the seat base so as to support your thighs. This for me, ever since I put sport seats in my BMW and I threw the standard ones away and I realized that you can tilt the, the seat itself and have an extending thigh support, that was a game changer for me. And well, it ruined many car seats for me. I would have liked an extending cushion for, the, for, for your thighs, of course, which this doesn't have. But the fact that you can raise the, uh, the front part of the cushion to support your thighs is great. And these seats are so, so good. They don't have lateral support, but do you want it? No, because you're not gonna drive this around corners particularly quickly, because it really, really rolls. and it feels like it's floaty, <laughs> but in a good way. You never feel like you're out of control or something. I really like this interior. It's very, very good. And you get lots of subtle detailing. So I was mentioning the pattern on the wood that's also repeated on this gray plastic here. Well, that pattern is comprised of chevrons. And you also get to see some chevrons in this very, very cool stitching here on the leather on the door card. And it's also present on the seats, on the upper part of the seats with the gray leather. What else is there to say about the interior? Well, one thing is how you adjust the height of the HUD. 
and you actually use the controls for the mirrors. So there's a special position on this switch here, and if you set it to the HUD, you can then adjust its height without having to go through menus or uh, having a truly dedicated button. Well, this is a dedicated button, but it's multi-purpose, and you can also fold the mirrors with it if you so please. The HUD itself, let's talk about it for a second. I hate the type of head-up displays that have the plastic screen that pops up, and I just hate those. I would never, never, ever want one of those in a car that I own because it looks bad, it looks cheap, and it doesn't do the greatest job of providing you the information. This system, however, is like the ones in fancier cars. It is embedded in the upper part of the dash behind the uh, instrument binnacle, well, the, the screen that serves as an instrument binnacle, and it projects directly onto the windscreen. And it's not intrusive at all. It is so, so much better. I would also like to mention that I don't know what brand the sound system in this vehicle is. If it was a fancy brand, I bet Citroen would have put that brand's logo somewhere, but it isn't displayed anywhere. And that's a shame because they should be praised for creating such a good sound system. It's clear, it is a uh, bassy, there's little distortion when you crank the volume all the way up. It's good, it's, it's very good, I'm impressed. When it comes to the way this vehicle looks, when I first saw it, I had mixed feelings, as you do with new cars that have unusual design. Seeing one in person for the first time completely changed my opinion and shifted my opinion to a very, very positive one. I love the look of this car and I hate crossovers. I don't like the look of crossover. I don't like mini SUVs, but this doesn't try to be a crossover. It's just a tall hatchback with a fastback style rear end. The front end is dominated by V-shaped lights, as is the rear end, and they give the vehicle a very, very unique look. From the side, I like the fact that you can get the roof in black, so you can have it contrast with the body, which in this case is a pearl type white, whose name I forgot. And I really like the floating roof design. There's also a chrome strip that runs along the upper part of the, of the side windows, and I also think that's a very nice touch. It, it looks good for some reason. It's not something that I usually notice, but in this vehicle, it looks really nice. My tester rides on 19-inch wheels, which don't seem to affect comfort at all. I imagine that this would be even better on smaller wheels, although you might also um, increase some of the negative handling characteristics of a vehicle that's this soft and floaty. So the steering might feel less connected than it does in this vehicle with the 19 inch wheels. And it might feel even more wallowy and roly poly, as they say. This is pleasantly roly poly. I also like the rear end design. The hatch in the back actually has two spoilers. One is mounted on the roof and you may not notice it at first. And there's another one which is lower down on the hatch, which is a combination of a duck tail and a whale tail. It's somewhere in between those types of spoilers. And I think that while they don't make the car look sporty, they certainly add visual interest. And I bet Citroen will tell you that they are also functional. This vehicle also has very pronounced flanks that, you know, it's almost voluptuous, but I would stop short of calling it voluptuous. But it's certainly not flat and uninteresting. And to be fair, it looks like a Citroen. So I think the automaker nailed it. I also like the shape of the mirrors. They seem very uh, feminine and nice and sculptural. Although they could have been maybe a bit bigger, but they look good. So I accept the trade-off. All in all, I'm pleasantly surprised by this vehicle. I think it shows the fact that Citroen is trying to um, reaffirm its brand ethos. Finally, after many years of living in Peugeot's shadow. And I hope that they bring out more cool, interesting, and genuinely desirable vehicles like the C5X. My Shine trim level tester costs around 38,000 euros and that includes, a, I think it's a 2,000 euro discount from Citroen Romania, if I'm not mistaken. And you can still add some options to it like uh, the panoramic glass roof that opens and a few other bits. A fully loaded top of the range plug-in hybrid is over 50,000. And I think that makes it um, less desirable than this vehicle with the mid-range powertrain, which I think, again, is the one you should have. It's really, really pokey cruising up to this road on the highway doing the speed limit and a bit over, I was impressed by how linearly this vehicle pulls at high speeds. All C5Xs come with the same eight speed automatic gearbox as standard. And it does a perfectly good job of shifting gears at higher speeds. It is somewhat jerky in town and setting off. And in the first three gears, you 
you do feel um, a bit of unpleasantness when it shifts gears, but it's not bad. And at higher speeds, it's perfectly adequate. This makes it not the best vehicle to drive in town, but then again, it's almost five meters long and it is a vehicle you would buy specifically to go on road trips with. And I think in that respect, the plug-in hybrid version doesn't make sense. It is, as I said, considerably more expensive, but if you don't charge it regularly, it's not going to be that much more efficient than this 1.6, which by the way, has a claimed efficiency rating of 6.6 .6 liters per 100 kilometers. And that's because it's a reasonably light vehicle. It's fairly aerodynamic. It actually, depending on spec, you can get it below 1.5 tons, although I'm pretty sure this one with all the fanciness, like the, the cooled and massaging seats, that certainly adds weight and it's probably 1.5 tons, but that's still not heavy by today's standards, considering this is a heavy vehicle with um, active and passive safety systems. For instance, it has adaptive cruise control that works very well, autonomous emergency braking, it holds the lane. And if you're like me and you don't want a pointlessly tall crossover, whose extra height you don't really need 99.999% of the time, this vehicle is perfect. I can't stress enough how much I like it. I'm really happy to have been given the chance to drive it and uh, open my eyes, frankly. It's a great piece of kit. Take it for a test drive and um, especially if you like the Citroen brand as I do, you will definitely, definitely appreciate it. Thank you for watching.